Are you ready to get dirty again? It's time for part three of my potting mix ingredients A to Z. My name's Jane Perone and I'm the host of this here podcast, On The Ledge, a cornucopia of houseplant info. Today, I bring you the final part of my epic <laughs> three-part series into the things that make up the stuff that goes around the roots of your house plants. I can't put it any more plainly than that. Plus, I answer a question about mixing it up, putting more than one plant of different species in the same pot. And in fact, because, well, because I feel like it, we're going to start with question of the week this week, which comes from Jill, who says they're an avid outdoor gardener, but new to houseplants. Well, welcome to the world of indoor gardening, Jill. Good to have you on board. Jill has what they describe as a possibly odd scenario. Ooh, I do like an odd scenario. OK, let's look at the details Jill actually is an ideal candidate to start her own indoor jungle because she has a yarn dyeing studio because she's got big pans of water steaming throughout the day. It's warm and humid. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, listener? Yes, I think Jill's going to end up with uh, a lot of houseplants before long and they're going to absolutely love that warm, humid environment. Jill says that not really knowing much about houseplants... I potted a prayer plant, snake plant and variegated ficus all in the same large pot. All seem to be happier and putting up new growth, but the prayer plant is getting massive. Should I plant them in separate pots or just let them fill the one they're in? Is now an OK time to repot or should I wait? Jill is in the northeast US. Well, Jill, what a lovely problem to have. I am all for mixed planting. It's something that comes up now and again in the show. And we really should talk more about it because it is a really great way of creating beautiful houseplant displays. Now, the plants that you're talking about in your particular arrangement, you've got a snake plant, Sansevieria or, well, Dracaena to use the correct genus name, although I can't quite come to terms with that yet. A prayer plant, so presumably something from the Maranta group. We don't know exactly what, but I guess that actually what it, whichever one it is, the answer will be the same. And a variegated ficus. How will they live together? Well, obviously, for the moment, they're living together very well because they're putting on good growth. And the pear, prayer plant is starting to do its thing and get enormous. So what should Jill do? I think in the long term... The snake plant of that trio is the plant that may be the least happy with that setup. Snake plants can cope with a huge spectrum of conditions, and that's why they're so popular as houseplants. But ideally, they will like a slightly more free draining potting mix than the other two. And they'll also love a good exposure to full sun. I know lots of people suggest snake plants for the deepest shade but really if you can give them sun and a good blast of heat in the summer you do get much better growth and results and it opens up the possibility that the plants will flower which is especially nice because Sansevieria flowers are lovely. I think going into the autumn fall for you Americans out there, that it's probably fine to leave the plants as they are for the winter. The only worry really is that you'll need to water the Maranta more than the Sansevieria would like. It's a tricky one. I would say probably that if, if the Maranta is getting really, really big, it is worth taking the time now to separate out the plants and redo the, the companion planting thing, but with a slightly different combination. I would take that set up apart. The Sansevieria, that would look great with uh, other Sansevierias. So you could have a mixed planting of various Sansevierias in the same big pot. I always think that looks amazing. So you could have one of the tall Sansevierias, Cylindrica or Trifasciata, And then around it, you can have some of the bird's nest types like Harnii. So Think about that as one option. I know it probably involves buying more plants or you could just pot the Sansevieria up separately. And when you do that, you can give it a bit of a grittier mix than the other two. 
Then your Maranta and your Ficus, you could keep those in a mixed planting and replace the Sansevieria with something like a low-growing Fittonia or a low-growing Pilea, the Heartleaf Fern, Hemionitis aerifolia, or you could have something like Pilea libanensis, a trailing Pilea, trailing over the side of the pot. You may be wondering why I'm recommending doing this repotting now at the end of the growing season. Oftentimes people panic about potting at this time of year. With cacti and succulents, I'd be cautious about doing it. If you do have to repot cacti and succulents now, then make sure the potting mix is pretty much just slightly damp as opposed to soaking wet because the plants are going into their dormant period on the whole but I think with most of these plants which are tropical subtropical plants they're kind of used to growing all year round and right now they will be fine the one caveat is don't put them into an enormously bigger pot try to keep the pot size roughly the same so those root balls aren't surrounded by a massive swathe of unrooted compost but I think it should be fine and offsets the risk of the Sansevieria rotting over the winter because you're having to water the Maranta more than the Sansevieria needs. When you're setting up a mixed planting the main thing to think about is what will go well together. They've obviously got to be all in the same setting so choose plants that all like full sun or all like partial shade. And also think about how much moisture they like around the roots. All these things will make the difference between success and failure when it comes to mixed plantings. And bear in mind that, you know, it's not a permanent solution. Probably once every one or two years, you'll have to be breaking them up and moving things on. Some plants will grow much faster than others. These arrangements don't last forever, but they do look fantastic. So do give it a try. And I hope, Jill, that that helps you have some ideas for your particular arrangement. I'd love to see a photo of your yarn studio and all the plants in it because it sounds amazing. If you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com and I will do my best to answer. It really helps if you can include your location and pictures and as much information about the plants as you can. Because telling me your plant's got yellowing leaves, it could be literally anything. So bung over loads of information and I will do my best to help. Thanks to all of you who have supported my crowdfunder for my book, Legends of the Leaf. We're at 23% as I speak, which is very exciting with 156 supporters backing the book. There is still plenty of time to show your support if you would like to claim your copy. The book will not go ahead unless I get 100% funded. Uh, the, the, <laughs> don't, don't worry, if, if it doesn't get funded, you will get your money back. So there's no risk involved, really. It's just a bit of an investment in your future enjoyment of my words, which will come as soon as I can get the book written and produced. And I tell you what, I've started doing some research and I found out some really cool and interesting stuff about one of the plants I plan to feature. So yeah, I'm really looking forward. I'm itching to write this book. So please help me out by pledging. The pledges range from 10 pounds for the ebook to 35 pounds for a collectible signed first edition and your name in the back yes you can get your name in the book how exciting would that be so please do take a look at the different options for pledging there's lots up there and there will be some new ones being added so do keep your eyes on my unbound page i'll put a link in the show notes and it's also linked in my instagram profile as well. And if you don't have funds to support the project at the minute, I totally understand. Please do send it on to everyone you know who is growing an indoor jungle because I would love to get the word out as far and wide as possible. And if you listen to the Skinny Jean Gardener podcast this week, I'll put a link in the show notes. You can hear me talking a bit more about the book with host Lee Conley. It's tremendous fun. So do go and have a listen to that. Thank you to D. Elizabeth K. and Kimbrel9 in the US who have left lovely reviews for On The Ledge podcast. Glad to hear you've been enjoying the show. It's time to get cracking with our A to Z of Potting Mix Ingredients Part 3. And we're on the P's today. <laughs> uh, we've got three P's, an R, an S, a V and a W. Are you ready? Right. Well, I mean, the first P is Pete. 
I'm not going to talk a huge amount about peat because I've already done an episode on it and I will link that in the show notes. It's episode 103. But I'll summarise here. What is peat? Well, it's basically moss that has broken down over millions of years and turned into peat, which is found in acidic wetlands all over the world. And the thing about peat is once you've taken it out of that bog, it's not going to regenerate for millions and millions of years further. So it's a non-renewable resource. I've been growing without peat for, well, let's just think about a year and a half now. And I've had no problems. Uh, if you remember back to episode 103, I interviewed Sean Higgs of Flora Live, which is a carnivorous plant nursery in the UK. Lots of people say that you can't grow carnivorous plants without peat, but Sean is proving that you can. So it's really not a substance that we need in our houseplant world anymore. Look out when you're reading potting mix packets because oftentimes they won't tell you they contain peat. This is a particular problem with John Innes mixes, which I talked about in the last episode. Do look because it should say somewhere the percentage of peat in the mix. And oftentimes you'll find that packets marked organic or natural uh, will still contain peat because, of course, peat is both organic and natural. Um, these two words are so vague that there isn't really any useful meaning to them. So I'd urge you, if you can, to switch to peat-free suppliers. I use Melcourt Silvergrow. I've also used Fertile Fibre and Dalefoot here in the UK. I'm not so familiar with the US products, but again, it is worth looking into peat-free options where you can. P number two is perlite. And if you remember, I've got Mr. Houseplant, aka Vladan Nikolic, to help me with these episodes. And so I'm going to hand over to Vlad to explain what perlite is and what you can use it for. Perlite is a volcanic rock that is mined and then heated at high temperatures in order to expand. And is generally used to improve drainage and provide good aeration. It's light, it's easily available, you can buy it in a lot of places, and it's very affordable. It's also pH neutral, has a pH of 7. Uh, it comes in different sizes. I like to use coarser perlite, and uh, it's generally good practice to get it wet before using, as there can be a lot of dust flying around when you work with perlite. But uh, all in all, it's a, it's a great amendment. Uh, the only disadvantage is it has a tendency to flow to the top of the soil after watering. Yeah, you do have to be careful with perlite because it is incredibly dusty. So wet it first and do wear a mask if you have sensitive lungs, because it can be quite evil if you get a lung full of that. Sustainability wise, well, perlite is a non-renewable resource. It's lightweight, so it doesn't cost a lot to transport. The argument for perlite is that there's supposed to be a really big amount of it left in the world, that we've mined just 1% of the total perlite uh, allowance in on the earth. But the stuff still has to be mined and processed. So if we can find an alternative that is renewable, well, all to the good. It's something that I've been looking out for some alternatives to for a while. The difficulty is that perlite, like grit and like vermiculite, because it's not an organic substance, it doesn't break down over time. And therefore, it's a really good addition to your potting mixes because it holds that soil structure and makes sure those air holes remain. So that's why it's really difficult to find a good alternative to perlite. Oh, so we'll skip ahead to R, which is for rice husks at this point, because I have been trialing them as an alternative to perlite. What I can tell you is that they're okay. <laughs> they do break down after, I'd say after by about within about six months of using them in a potting mix, they were starting to break down. So not really ideal if you're wanting to use them for cacti or succulents because they're not going to help maintain that soil structure in the longer term. They are really high in silica, which, as we've heard from previous episodes, can be a good thing, but they're really, really quite expensive compared to perlite. So give them a go. But yeah, they are an expensive alternative. 
One other alternative to perlite that I'm excited about but haven't yet had a chance to try are called grow stones and these are made from 100% recycled glass. I'll put a link in the show notes to an interesting article I found about an experiment that tested perlite and rice hulls against grow stones and came out with favourable results. And in fact, a product that I have tried, Natnix, uh, seems to be a fine version of the grow stones, which you can use to top pots and discourage fungus gnats. So I'm interested in hearing more about grow stones. If you've tried them, do give me a shout and I'll certainly be looking for a UK supplier to give these a go. Because uh, if they're using recycled glass, great, big tick, 100% recycled, and they're they're high in silica and they're not causing any damage to the environment, then, hey, it sounds like a win-win to me, but I'm still doing my research. So please do let me know if you've got anything to add on this subject of perlite alternatives. One perlite alternative we have not mentioned yet is pumice. Over to Vlad to explain. Pumice is, um, it has advantages over uh, perlite. Um, it's also a volcanic rock. It's mined and crushed and then graded based on its size. It's very porous. It also improves drainage. I like it better than perlite because it's a little bit heavier, so it doesn't flow to the top of the pot. And uh, for me, it's pretty annoying. You know, after a few waterings, it just the whole top of my soil is covered with perlite. But when I use pumice, this doesn't happen. But the problem with pumice is that it's... Uh, more expensive and it's not that easily available as perlite which is probably why not that many people use it. I have to admit I do quite like pumice as an ingredient in potting mixes and as you'll know if you've listened to my euphorbia episode with Bob Potter some people use this as a hundred percent of their substrate when they're growing cacti and succulents. Pumice is a volcanic rock and is produced when lava escapes from a volcano. So in some sense, senses, it is kind of a renewable resource in that obviously volcanoes are erupting all over the planet all the time. And when it's mined, well, it's mined from the surface because obviously that's where the, the lava is flowing. So there is an argument to say it's not as an invasive a process as mining for other materials. But as Vlad points out, it's more expensive than perlite, which is perhaps why people don't use it as much. Probably depends on where you are in the world as to how freely available pumice is to you. But it's certainly worth a look as another way of adding aeration to your soil. And next up, S is for sand. I have to admit, I don't really use much sand these days mainly because it's incredibly heavy. Like the grit, it's something that is going to make your pots uh, weighty, to say the least. Its main quality is meant to be improving drainage. Every grower has their own feelings about sand, I find, and some people find that if you use sand that's too fine, less than about one or two millimetres in diameter, in terms of particle size, then it just gets really hard like cement in the pot and doesn't actually do the mix any good. If you are going to buy sand, make sure that you buy horticultural sand because regular builder sand and the like can be way too high in lime. You're looking for more of a neutral pH to match the pH that your houseplants are going to like. One thing sand is really useful for is if you are sowing very fine seeds, Mix the seed with a handful of sand and sprinkle that over the surface of your tray and it makes it so much easier to ensure that your seeds aren't clumped in one corner. You'll also find that people have what's called a sand bench if you're lucky enough to have a glass house, which is basically a bench filled with sand and into that you can put cuttings and often there's uh, heating cables underneath to keep it warm and it's a really good way of starting off an awful lot of cuttings if you are lucky enough to have a greenhouse. You could do a much, much smaller version in your house where you've got a tray of sand with a heat mat underneath and that would work just as well. An alternative to the Laker if you don't have access to that. And now the penultimate item in our A to Z and that's V for vermiculite. Well, like perlite, this is another mineral that comes from the earth and it's heated and it goes hugely larger it expands hugely and it produces these kind of long wormy structures hence the name vermiculite from the latin vermiculare meaning to breed worms 
I'll post a link to a rather interesting website called madehow.com, which has an interesting piece on how vermiculite's actually made. Over to Vlad to explain a bit more about its pros and cons. It retains some water, but it also holds air. Its pH value can vary, so it can be from 6 to 9.5, depending on where it's been mined and how it's been processed. Um, so even different batches from the same mine can have different pH values. Um, so you got to be careful with that. And um, a disadvantage of vermiculite is that it compacts easily. When you touch it, it almost feels like clay. So with uh, some slight mechanical pressure, it can compact and lose its uh, water and air holding properties. Is it sustainable? Mm, well, like perlite, it's a non-renewable resource. Lots of energy goes into heating it to high temperatures so that it does that wormy thing. I think they call it exfoliation. So I'd say use vermiculite sensibly and where you can find renewable alternatives. That might be things like bark chips, expanded clay pebbles, laker and coir. The final ingredient in our potting mix melange is worm casts. What are worm casts? It's really just worm poo. I can't put it any more succinctly than that. You can buy these by the bag and they're absolutely jam packed with nutrients, organic matter and beneficial enzymes and bacteria as well. I've got a wormery and I certainly do use those worm casts in my garden. I don't think I'd be using those on my house plants though. The stuff that you buy in a bag has been specially screened and they will have removed any worm eggs and other things that you don't want in your houseplant potting mixes. I can't really do that with my garden worm casts, so they tend to go outside. I don't really want a load of worms or indeed slugs hatching into my houseplant potting soil. So this ingredient does have a lot of advantages and if you're growing hungry plants then it's really worth looking at as a soil addition. I'm thinking here of aroids then a good handful of worm casts when you're repotting will certainly not go amiss. Just remember if you are adding them to the soil that you won't need to add any extra fertilizer for a while because they're a really great source of nutrients. It is powerful stuff, so do go easy. You may, you may want to start off, if you're not in the process of repotting, with just sprinkling a small amount of the worm casts on the top of the soil, which will gradually work their way in and see how your plants react. And if you want the benefit of the worm castings without having to add them to the soil, then you can buy liquid fertilizers, which are made from worm castings. There's a few different brands out there, so do take a look. Well, that rounds up my guide to potting mix ingredients. What have I left out? What have I got wrong? What did you like? Please do drop me a line with your thoughts on potting mix ingredients. I'd love to hear from you. And perhaps you can even share with me your top secret potting mix recipe for your particular kind of houseplants. I love those little details of what you include in your potting mix recipes. Thanks to my guest Vladan Nikolic this week. And if you want to hear the entire interview that I did with Vladan, then you need to be a Patreon subscriber. I'll be putting it up on the Patreon feed over the weekend. So if you're a Patreon subscriber, do listen out for that. And Michelle, Joshua and Christopher, who've become Patreon subscribers at the legend level this week, will be able to listen. Enjoy, you guys. Find out more about how to become a patron on my show notes, which are at janeperone.com. And patrons, how do you feel about another Zoom session? Thinking of doing another one of those soon. Let me know if you're up for that and I will organise that for a hopefully not this weekend but the weekend after details to come shortly into your patreon messages that's all for this week's show i hope you've enjoyed it and i'll be back next friday in the meantime keep your pecker firmly in the up position whether you've got a weekend chock-a-block with activity or some seriously needed downtime with your plants. Have fun, stay safe, and everything will be tickety-boo. Bye.
The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops and Overthrown by Josh Woodward. Both tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. See my website, janeperone.com, for details. Yeah.